The cops came, and, and the officer didn't know how to work the camera, so uh, my client helped take the pictures for the officer. <laughs> When we got to court, I remember getting to the Chilliwack Courthouse and the officers dragging these plants up the stairs and along the hall, all the buds and everything was dry by this time they were falling off. People were scooping them up. <laughs> they charged me with um, trafficking an unlimited amount of marijuana, and I was yeah. trying to convince my parents how cool that was. <laughs> a smoke-in to respond to Operation Dustbin, which was a crackdown on all the pot yeah. dealers in Vancouver. Yeah, yeah. And then they came out at 8.30 on August 7th, 1971. Yeah. They had a bunch of real joints and an eight-foot-long fake one. And they <laughs> lit it up and passed it around and banged their tambourines yeah. and said, power to the people, and we shall overcome, and smoke their joints. And by 10 o'clock at night, there was 2,000 people in Maple Tree Square. And the radio stations were told to stop reporting on it because the crowd was getting too big and too scary for the police. And the police were like, well, we can't let them get away with blocking traffic and smoking pot with impunity. We have to maintain the shame because in scapegoating, the shame is everything. And if it disappears, it doesn't work anymore. Well so, put. Uh, so they had to maintain the shame, so they just used military might against a good idea. And that always backfires, because it was on the front cover of every newspaper in Canada the next day how brutal and unnecessarily harsh the police were. And I mean, that's what happened. The Chinese came to Canada, they got introduced to opium by the British and the Turks mm -hmm. in the Opium Wars, and they came to Canada and built the railroads. They came to Western United States as well. We have a huge history of the Chinese population doing that. And then Whitey said, you're taking our jobs and you're seducing white women in the opium dens. And uh, we had race riots in Vancouver, Victoria, and New Westminster. And Chinese people made claims for loss of opium product. And Mackenzie King, who was Minister of Labor, said, oh, we got to have a Royal Commission of Inquiry into this horrible thing that's going on, all these people and this problem. You go to the Dominion Annual Review of Statistics for that period of time, and we're talking 1910, 1908, right in that sort of period, and you'll see Chinamen deported possession of opium products. So, I mean, that's what it was, and uh, I disagree a little bit with David, because if you look at the history of the United States, Utah, which if you heard on the radio or the TV the other day, said they're not going to legalize medical marijuana. Utah was the first state to make it illegal. Bear in mind, criminal law is state in the U.S. It's federal in Canada, and that's important. So between 1915 and 1937, 27 states, I think it was, slowly made it illegal across the country. The first batch, because of the Mexicans, uh, it, the Utah Mormons couldn't marry more than one woman anymore, so they went to Mexico, came back with the uh, cannabis habit, and uh, the church then made it illegal throughout Utah. So there was a, a bunch of states were because of the Mexicans. Then there was Mexican workers in another group of states that they said were crazy, illness, crazy weed. And then there was a third group of states that it was more to do with alcohol substitution. You've got to remember, alcohol prohibition was all coming off and going in that whole period as well. And so, you know, that then finally led in 1937 to the U.S. But we were in 1923, when all of this stuff was going on, the reefer madness stuff, particularly in California, when that's what Janie Canuck wrote in her book, uh, which was serialized in McLean's Magazine, which was a way to reach our parents and so on. And uh, that's uh, how it happened. Uh, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> well, there's another answer to that question that I like to point people to. I, I, I wrote a uh, chapter in something called The Pop Book, and in it I explain that there's a lot of money in the hemp's, hemp substitute industry. Mm -hmm. Like, not just the medicine side, which is a trillion dollars, but the, the fuel side, which is like three or four trillion. I don't know the exact number. A lot of money in the hemp substitute industries, and there was a lot of collusion amongst the academics and the corporate side to demonize first opium and Asians and then Mexicans and, mar and marijuana to remove the natural to monopolize on the synthetic. Well, the natural's coming back and that's the result of Yay. this. Right?
then there was a woman who used to call the store all the time asking about medical cannabis. And she had a million questions, and she was in her late 60s, and she was mostly bedridden from her arthritis. And she was the first person that I ever brought cannabis to. So I remember the like patchwork skirt I was wearing when I went <laughs> back in those days. But so I went over to her apartment and she buzzed me in, and I know some of you in this room have probably heard this story before, but I climbed up on her bed and I had a bag of weed and we talked about it and looked at it and I rolled a joint and we smoked it and looking at her, it was like watching chunks of cement come off her in terms of her like, oh, like it was like she was waking up from like a hundred years sleep. And she was able to make a cup of tea and carry a cup of tea into where we were sitting. And then she started crying and yelling and freaking out and was so mad that this plant had been held away from her all of this time. And I was pretty high at the moment with her. And I had kind of like a, not like a hallucination, but sort of a vision of an ocean of people that were suffering and this plant on the other side and this wall of injustice. And I realized like something landing on my lap that I needed to like do whatever it took to kick the shit out of that wall until it came down. Something I should stop right now and say uh, about this woman here is that if there was no Hillary Black, there'd be no medical marijuana movement in Canada, and there'd be no recreational mar marijuana movement in Canada because it all stems from Hillary's bravery in '95, first out of the closet, well, semi out of the closet, and then fully out of the closet pot dealer uh, uh, of medical in Canada. And she took a big risk, and uh, she did a great job, and so we all owe Hillary. Because the demand was overwhelming, like we had an avalanche of people coming through that organization. Like sometimes we had two and three month wait lists and had to prioritize people that were palliative. And this was like me and a couple of my girlfriends. We were in our early twenties, and we started hiring some of the expertise that we needed. Hiring somebody who has a master's in healthcare administration, Gail Kapler, who has dedicated many years of her psych nurse, hiring just like all of the expertise that we needed to deal with the kind of crazy situation that we were in. But um, <laughs> They arrest her for selling crazy cookies on the beach. It was a riot. She was an institution on that beach. Yeah. So. And she was naked when they arrested her. That's of course. And <laughs> of so course. the next couple of times, I think they waited until she was at the top of the stairs <laughs> in order to not have a riot. And uh, Tell them your argument when we went to court, they uh, looked at the cookie, the expert looked at the cookie, he didn't see any green plant-like material, so he said it can't be cannabis marijuana, it's got to be cannabis resin, but they didn't do any other tests for it. And so they, my wife said, you know, when you put something in a cookie, but you're not going to be able to find it in the batter and so on, so how come they didn't do any tests in order to figure out where this, if anything, was in there? Yeah. We had a pretty conservative judge, but she still... Uh, concluded that the police had failed to prove that this was cannabis yeah. resin, and yeah. so she walked. And so my advice uh, to her was never sell a cookie to anybody on a nude beach who has their clothes on. <laughs> had a lot of milestones, but uh, I think one most appropriate for this uh, was the time this woman and two others unarrested me out of the hands of 12. 13 police officers in Victory Square Park. It was 1998, <laughs> and the cops were coming down hard on the pot people. There was daily raids, and they would bust for anything, jaywalking, uh, pot possession, uh, looking at them funny, and they were just, it was a crackdown. It was, it was basically a crackdown on the pot people. And Hemp BC at the time wasn't Mark Emery owned. He had to sell the place because they had uh, discriminated against him. It was Sister Icy, Hemp BC, and they were having a, 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 I think it was a press conference with the BC Civil Liberties Association and their lawyer about the crackdown and oppression and persecution of the pot people in 1998 in the fall. Me and the electrician of the movement, Adam, were in Victory <laughs> Square playing hacky sack ten minutes before, just to loosen up before the big event, right? And this one cop decided, well, he's going to bust us for 
playing games on the sidewalk, even though we were in the park. He was like, you're obstructing the sidewalk. <laughs> they picked the wrong people to bust that day, because uh, he's like, uh, you have any ID? He was a motorcycle cop. He actually obstructed the sidewalk with his motorcycle <laughs> to come at us in the park. He said, you have any ID? I said, no. He said, well, you're coming with me. <laughs> and, and I started shouting, help, help, I'm getting arrested. It wasn't my first time getting arrested on that block, mind you. Yeah. And uh, help, help, I'm getting arrested. And he started choking me so I yeah, couldn't I breathe. I was actually off the ground because I had now two cops on me. Another one had just so happened to be in the neighborhood. And it helped him out. And I was, I, well, my feet weren't touching the ground. I was being choked out. Well, they heard my initial call, uh, calls from across the street, my first screams of help. And uh, on came uh, two lawyers, inclu including Cameron Ward, who had a uh, lawyer's office in the Dominion building. He heard my cries. Three lawyers, uh, all of the media, again, of Vancouver were there for the press conference. They all came across the street. And then, was it you or, or Icy? I think it might have been... both of us. Yeah, anyway. These women who are familiar with my theories on hug power, uh, decided to test them out and see if they'd work, decided to interfere with the arrest, and I got, a, I think, a back hug from both of you. It was nice. It was cuddly. Uh, I was like, you know, even if I do go to jail, it's totally worth it. And, uh, and so the cops, now they had to beat up Hillary Black and Sister Icy and another girl, Michelle, had to beat up three beautiful women in front of all the media to bust me for playing hacky sack in Victory Square Park. And after they called up their superiors, talked with like the head of the police or whatever, you know, some high-ranking member, they decided it was better off just to let us go. Uh -huh. And uh, I chastised them in front of the media, said, don't come back until you're calm. And slapped all their peepees on the public. And after that, we didn't have uh, as much of a problem with over-policing on the pop block. And, and again, thanks to the bravery of uh, women, uh, especially you, Hill, because you're, uh, you're a lioness. I was pissed. They were choking you. Yeah, 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 yeah hey. So it, it's the power of nonviolence, really. So meanwhile, there was this guy, Malmo Levine, who had this... That guy. Uh, Thing in the park in Vancouver, yeah. the Harm Reduction Club, as I recall, and uh, he was uh, telling people not to consume cannabis and operate complex machinery or drive, and he was trying to educate people about what to do and what not to do, and anyway, then they busted him, but for possession for the purpose of trafficking and trafficking, which are more serious offenses. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can't remember if you had a prelim, but whatever, he ended up with Judge Curtis, and, and we had to catch up to him because he was in a higher court with binding on the lower court and all this sort of thing. But ultimately, we ended up together in the Court of Appeal. And uh, fortunately, uh, one of the judges agreed with us in the Court of Appeal, and that gave us uh, a right of appeal in the Supreme Court of Canada. Along with my indictable offense. Along with, with uh, yeah, so you had a right of appeal anyway, that's right. So we got a right of appeal in the possession case. He had an automatic right of appeal. And Chris Clay had a store in Ontario and had some plants in the window. And uh, I think it was selling a little bit or something. And so they busted him too. And so all three of us uh, got to appear uh, as a trilogy, as they call it, in our business uh, in Supreme Court of Canada. And uh, it was uh, quite entertaining. We had this guy, Malmo Levine, wearing a hemp suit and a hemp tie. himself. <laughs> 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 and said that uh, Mr. Mamo Levine's lifestyle argument was not acceptable, that uh, <laughs> uh, we, uh, the harm principle was not a principle of fundamental justice, uh, an important animating principle in criminal law, but not the... And uh, that, you know, as they pass laws to promote health and uh, protect health and... Uh, and we're like cannibals. This was, we weren't talking about it from a health so point of view or anything like that. And uh, they said, look, it's up to Parliament. Parliament decides what level of harm they can criminalize and prohibit. It's for them, not for the courts. Go, go to Parliament. So, you know, they made it uh, clear that the, the, the recreational issue, uh, the social consumption issue, 
is not based on the potential violation of your constitutional rights. It's going to be given to you at the, what would you say, the generosity of the government? I don't think that's it. <laughs> Reluctantly given to the, the government as we move forward in terms of recreational. And so that was our first challenge to, to prohibition, which, uh, and so as you can see, the, the distinction later on with Allard being the, the right of, of medical access when a doctor approves you, mm -hmm. and so it's, it's for your health, so that a statute that says we're protecting your health but takes away your ability to get what your doctor says is good for your health is unconstitutional, and that's the basis for uh, Allard and, and, and some of the other cases that led to the ACMPR. But I caution, the ACMPR, of course, is simply the old MNPR in part one and the MMAR in part two, with a few little tweaks. Uh, and uh, so we're going to see what happens, and it's going to be interesting to see what happens with the Canvas Act uh, over top. Um, but, you know, we'll be watching to make sure that uh, people continue to get reasonable access. That's the bottom line in any attempt to take that away. And my view is that the Compassion Club model uh, that's what's missing, uh, it's got and that, yeah. uh, that, you know, again, Judge, uh, Judge Phelan and Allard said the heart of access is uh, the dispensary. And we just have to keep doing our work to try to spread this justice around the world. I mean, we've been busting ass for 20 years, and it's kind of like the work is just beginning again. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah.